Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fuel Cell Electric Bus Webinar Series 3, Low and No Grant Applications and Financing. I am Kim Leach, and I'll be walking you through today's session as the moderator. Today, we have three additional panelists, Sydney from KTC Consulting, and Paul from Hartford Steam Boiler, and Tyler from SEPTA, and Tim from Ballard Power Systems. As everybody knows, the low no uh, emission and grant for buses and bus facilities competitive program for 2023 deadline is fast approaching on April 13th, 2023 at 1159. There's two separate grants. Um, the purpose of the low and no program is to support the transition of the, of the nation's transit fleet and the, low, um, the lowest polluting and most energy efficient transit vehicles. And the second application that can be submitted is the bus and bus facilities competitive program. And it is to assess in the financing and buses and the bus facilities capital projects, including the replacement, the rehabilitation and purchasing, along with the construction and leasing of bus related facilities. Um, it was recently expanded to include zero emission fleets. So that's what we're here to talk about today. And the, today, the topics will cover information related to the funding program with additional details to help you complete that funding application to support your fleet and the relative technology that is going to move your fleet to zero emissions. The panelist screen today is um, the presentation is, expand, is expected to last 45 minutes. And those who have questions, please type them in the, in the chat box and our panelists will address them through their seminar. If it's direct to, to any of the panelists, please email them directly. And if it's more of a complicated question, we will respond in a timely fashion following the seminar. And don't forget to visit, visit ballard.com for information related to the latest technology deployments and fuel cell news. Again, I'm Kim Leach. I'm the Market Development Manager for Ballard Power Systems East. Our first panelist today is Sydney Kruger. She's the Managing Partner of KTC Transit Consulting and Ballard Manufacturer's Representative. When I ask Sydney, um, what are you striving towards to mitigate the barriers in hydrogen deployment and standardization and fueling systems to make adoption easier? She believes that clean air is a right, not a privilege and hydrogen is a fuel source for transit buses and they can reduce harmful emissions into the environment and improve the air quality for our local Sydney's, cities. Sydney, can you take away your presentation and then we'll follow up with Paul. Yes, hi, thank you so much everyone for joining our um, webinar this morning. We're super excited to talk to you about how you can submit a FTA low no, app, low no application for fuel cell. So I think we all know this is not a normal Lono year. I think we are in a very fortunate five years um, where the government is dedicating this 1.7 billion to low or no emission vehicles. I think we don't know how long this will last after this five year period. So I think this is really instrumental to take advantage of this now to submit for a fuel cell program. Um, we are in year two of five of increased funding. Um, and once again, this is a joint program for both Lono and bus and bus facilities. There's actually 1.2 billion available for Lono and 467,000, or 467 million, sorry, for bus and bus facilities. So the biggest chunk there is for Lono. Um, in 2021, over 100 million of the 414 million for bus and bus facilities went to zero emission buses, and a third of that went to hydrogen. So we're really proud that applications for hydrogen are increasing. Um, a big, um, I guess, suggestion for us is that you should it, you should submit your application twice for both Lono and bus and bus facilities to um, apply for both of those programs. Um, so while Lono is rapidly increasing, we also want you to notice that it's spreading across the U.S. So it's not just happening in California, but it really is across the country that we are seeing applications for fuel cell programs pop up. So everywhere from the East Coast, from Montgomery County to Rochester, to also to Delaware Transit. And I think Delaware is interesting to point out here. I think we run into some transit agencies that at times wonder if I'm putting together a battery applications for Lono, does that mean that I cannot submit one for fuel cell? And I think that Delaware Transit is a perfect example of being able to include both battery and fuel cell in a Lono application and win for both. 
Um, we also see here in Reno, both Las Vegas and, and Reno in Nevada submitted applications, Fresno, Omnitrans, Sunline, and Gold Coast in California, just to name a few. Next slide, please. Um, so just to go through a couple of success tips as you're looking through um, the Lono application in the supplemental form. So um, there are some new requirements this year. Um, the zero emission fleet rollout plan, um, six requirements did continue this year. Um, and there also is a new requirement for large fleets um, over 40, over 20, 40 foot buses that you have to explain and use the FTA um, zero emission uh, no emission reduction calculator to figure out your total emission reduction. So make sure to use that if you have a big um, proposal this year. Um, next slide. Um, in terms of evaluation criteria, so there are six main evaluation criteria that the FTA uses to essentially decide on awards. So for the first one here, we're just talking about the demonstration of need. So here you need to show that you have an unmet need for capital investment. So here they're really looking at what are the buses that you're replacing, what are what is their propulsion type, what is the age, what is the condition, what is their performance. So, you know, we're looking to clean up the air here. So um, the older the buses that you have and the dirtier propulsion type, so older diesel buses could receive a higher rating here that you are taking them off the street. Um, next slide. In terms of the second evaluation criteria here, we're looking at demonstration of benefits. For for Lono, we're, they're really looking at both quantitative and qualitative. So quantitative, we want to know how many tons of CO2 you are going to are going to be averted. For qualitative, qualitative, we're really looking at the description of the affected neighborhoods and the pollutants that you're going to remove. For bus and bus facilities, they want you to focus more here on um, President's Executive Order 14008, which is tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. Next slide. Um, this is just in terms of training and equipment. So remember that we have up to 5% of your total budget ask. It needs to be devoted to training. Ballard has put together an incredible training package where you're able to have one of our fuel cell power modules at your depot with even the addition of virtual reality. Um, that is a program that you can contact us and we will submit information on pricing to you to include in this year's LONO application. Next slide. Um, in terms of planning and local regional prioritization, local financial commitment and your budget. So in terms of local prioritization, so we want they want to see how is the proposed project consistent with your long and regional um, long range plan. So you need to show here that you have you know, a plan in place and that this aligns with local government priorities. This is where you also can talk about diverse letters of support from the community in which you are going to roll out the zero emission buses. You also need to show for financial commitment where, when the funds are available and what source they are coming from. In California, we have a lot of VW money to use and that can be used as a local match. Next slide. In terms of project scalability and project implementation strategy. So for project scalability, generally what we put in there for fuel cell programs are either the option to downsize the number of fuel cell buses you're deploying, or maybe to downsize the size of the infrastructure. So maybe to take out redundancy. So to take out a pump or to take out a dispenser and to give the FDA the ability to award your project, but maybe not at the scale you originally asked for. And then for implementation, this really helps if you if you form with a project partner like an industrial gas company, they can go through and lay out the milestone schedule and give you that implementation strategy. Keep in mind the FTA gives um, more consideration if you're able to obligate the funds within 12 months. We know most hydrogen infrastructure projects take about 14 to 18 months to build, so that's good to keep in mind there and then offer technical, legal, and financial capacity, you just need to show that you have the know-how to carry out the proposed project, and partnering with the right team is a great step in showing you know how to do it. Next slide. 
um, in terms of partnership provision. So this is huge. And I think this increases the rollout times across the country. The Loan No Prog Program allows for you to partner with um, equipment providers, project developers, and fueling providers and to directly list them in your project so that you can um, list sole source essentially and you don't have to go out to bid after this is awarded. Next slide. Um, in terms of additional consideration, so there was a big emphasis this year on supporting several of the executive orders and initiatives that, that are, involve climate change, environmental justice, racial equity, quality jobs, and workforce engagement. So it's good to reference these, to look over these, and to see if there's any way you can include these in, the, in your project, because in doing so, you might get more favorable consideration. Um, so there's, there's a couple tips that we will put in our success package for Lono um, that you will receive after this webinar. Also, FTA will prioritize projects that do include 100% full fleet transition to zero emissions. So if you've come up with that decision already internally at your agency, that is good to note in your application. Next slide. So we're just going to go over a little bit on the zero emission transition plan. I know this has been a new requirement as of the last two years. We just did a little diagram here showing you again the six different elements in the zero emission fleet transition plan that need to be clearly present and labeled. When you're putting this together, this will be an additional attachment in your application. If you already have a plan in place, you can do a memo highlighting where in the plan these six, these six sections can be found. Um, next slide. So keep in mind for these plans, it was highlighted that these could be as short as one to two pages. So if you are a small agency, you haven't yet hired a consultant to give you a full zero emission rollout plan. If you're able to answer these six questions and do it within one to two pages, that is okay for this grant cycle. Um, you do potentially need to talk to your procurement um, department to go through what you are considering here. You do need to, it would be a good idea to talk to a workforce representative within the agency, to talk to a fuel provider, and also just to keep this plan simple, keep it easy to understand and easy to improve. And um, we want to give you a little idea of an updated budget. Um, we know with inflation, some costs have gone up and wanted to give you just a good idea of what a project might look like. So this was a project for two hydrogen fuel cell buses and a station that could fuel up to 50 buses. So this was a hydrogen fueling station, the buses, construction, detailed design and permitting, utility upgrades, project management, facility mods, and workforce development. So we put this together for a total project budget of about 12 million um, with a federal ask of about 10 million. Um, keep in mind in this budget, we did have the tank included. You can purchase the liquid tank or you can lease it. Lease it. And here we included it as a capital purchase. And for, for facility mods, we included 500,000 in the budget for that. Um, so please feel free to use this as an estimated idea of a budget for a, um, a fuel cell project for Lono. Well, thank you, Sydney. That was a lot of information. Um, up next, we have Tyler Ladd. He's going to be talking about finding and working with consultants for fuel cell electric bus deployments, vitally important part of the whole application and, and fleet um, development process. Um, Tyler leads the SEPTA's uh, department as director of power engineering with the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority, and it's this, the nation's sixth largest transit system. Tyler is um, the director of that department. And when I asked um, what his interest is in hydrogen and fuel cell electric buses, it started over two years ago um, at a zero emission bus conference. This has only grown since then. And what they find so exciting about fuel cell electric buses is that they provide all the benefits of zero emission buses with very few of the drawbacks. His team envisions a future where zero emission hydrogen buses provide clean sustainable sustainability and reliable service for their riders. Thanks, Tyler. It's yours to take away. Uh, great. Thanks, Kim. Uh, I think I'm actually wearing the same shirt in that photo, so that's fun. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm out here on the East Coast. Uh, as Kim said, my name is Tyler Ladd. I'm the Director of Power Engineering for SEPTA. 
Uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about some of our experiences and lessons learned working with consultants uh, as they relate to our zero emission bus and fuel cell electric bus efforts. Uh, next slide. So uh, SEPTA is the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority. Uh, we're a multimodal transportation agency in the city of Philadelphia and the surrounding counties. Uh, we're the sixth largest transit agency in the country. Uh, we had pre-COVID ridership of over a million riders a day. Um, and right now the number is around 600,000 and they're slowly coming back up as people uh, re return to the offices. About 50% of our ridership comes from our bus network. So as, we, as we've approached this zero emission bus conversation, uh, we've drawn to great lengths to make sure that we're not impacting that ridership and our levels of service uh, for those riders. Next slide. So when we look at um, our bus fleet, um, we have about 1,400 buses, a mixture of 40 and 60 foot, uh, spread out over eight bus districts, uh, six of which are in the city of Philadelphia and two of which are in the suburbs. We have a service area of over 2,200 square miles. So when we're looking at zero emission buses, uh, we have a lot of range issues, a lot of topography issues, in addition to our, our climate that really had to be taken into account and was one of the reasons that fuel cell electric buses uh, we're so attractive um, as we went through our analysis. Uh, next slide. So it, it was funny when I was putting this together. Um, you know, these are all the official reasons that we're exploring zero emission buses. Uh, you know, we have a strategic master plan. We want to provide clean, reliable, and sustainable service. Uh, as our conversation today is, you know, we're focusing on the low no grant application, um, the access to that funding, needing some of the, the fleet transition plans. Um, and ultimately you want to be good stewards of, our public, of public money. But the overarching thing, which I think gets lost in the conversation is, it's the right thing to do. You know, the technology exists today to give our riders, our employees and our communities clean air and all the environmental benefits that come with transition and zero emission buses. So while all these parts are important and all the technical information is, you know, really exciting and interesting, uh, you know, this, we can make a difference in people's lives over and above what we do just as a transit agency uh, to begin with, which is what's really exciting in the conversation. Next slide. So when we're talking about working with consultants, um, it's something that has been a tremendous asset uh, to us here at SEPTA. Our consultant teams, uh, we, we talk with them on a daily basis. They provide a, a huge benefit to us. And really when we look at the relationship, you know, our, our focus as an agency is really on moving people. That's why we're here. That's what our, our focus is and should be. That's what our mission is. So by utilizing consultant teams, um, we're able to focus on what we do best and then bring in the necessary resources um, and let them focus on what they do best. So working with our consultants has offered some really distinct advantages. Um, it allows them to bring de dedicated extension of staff uh, to our projects and to, to our efforts and analyses. We're also able to set a schedule. So we have known progress reports. We know when deliverables are gonna be coming in. Um, and ultimately it allows for a faster turnaround in a lot of our projects and reports, um, as opposed to trying to do this in addition to all of our additional responsibilities and working on it when we can, um, because something always, you know, always gets back burnered. Um, but then also what we find is they're really subject matter experts in this field. Um, with zero emission buses and fuel cell buses, you know, as they're great gaining in popularity, you know, there's still a significant learning curve. Um, so they're able to bring an outside perspective to the conversation uh, based on their experience and their research, you know, working with other agencies. Um, and what's also nice is uh, they're kind of independent of internal politics. You know, they're really just focusing on the task at hand and uh, delivering the best possible product um, and analysis that they can uh, for what we're asking them to do. And then lastly, what we've found is they've been a great source of best practices um, and innovative solutions uh, based on their work with other agencies in other parts of the country, getting a feel for what works and what doesn't, uh, where we can really steer our conversation and what areas to focus on that will be the most beneficial to us. Uh, next slide. So what we found when we're evaluating and choosing the consultant teams to work with, um, you know, well, the first thing that comes up is, you know, how do we find them? And we found that, you know, we recognize we are in a little bit of a uh, advantageous position because of the size of we, that we are and the size of our fleet, that a lot of times, you know, consultants will come to us. Um, but there have been specific uh, projects or specific, uh, specific efforts where we've had to go out and, you know, find consultants. So what we recommend is, you know, reach out to partner agencies, you know, like ourselves to other agencies in your area, um, see what kind of projects or who they've worked with and get recommendations. 
and then reach out to the consultants directly and ask them to come in. And that's something that we found has been uh, tremendously advantageous is coming in and letting them give, you know, give their sales pitch um, you know, to our team to really understand who they are, who's on their team, what their capabilities and experience are, and allows us to kind of drill down and to understand um, how familiar are they with our agency, with our operations. Um, it allows us to get an example of uh, their previous work, what they've done for other agencies, because a lot of times, in some cases, we don't know what we are asking for. So by seeing examples of reports that they've done and seeing examples of fleet transition plans really allows us to really define our scope <clears throat> to a targeted approach to ultimately get what we're looking for that'll be most beneficial to us. <clears throat> but then something also we found is there are some potential pitfalls just with this emerging, you know, this emerging uh, industry and area. Um, a common misconception is that ZEB, Z zero emission buses are just battery. Uh, that is not even close to the case. Um, fuel cell bus, fuel cell electric buses provide a tremendous opportunity, tremendous advantages over battery technology that we're seeing as we talk with other agencies. Um, there's a shift in this direction for a reason. Um, but what we're seeing though is some, some consultants might only be familiar with one technology. They might favor a specific technology or it might be a natural extension of the services they're already providing. Where especially when we start talking about the hydrogen space, this is kind of a little bit of a new animal for, for some companies. Um, so what we've been really trying to make sure is that the consultant teams we're working with, um, you know, they're not pseudo experts. Uh, they're not taking some of the readily available information for the technologies and repackaging that uh, under the guise of a detailed analysis uh, that they're not learning on our dime, trying to figure out hydrogen at the same time we are, that they're providing, you know, actual tangible value to our efforts as we move forward. And then lastly, on the next slide, we have when we start looking at how are we evaluating the deliverables and recommendations that our consultant teams are making to us, we've really gone to great lengths to make sure that we're getting a full picture of the analysis, um, that we're, you know, we're not favoring one technology or another, that we're letting the data speak for itself whether it's good, bad, or ugly in my case. So what we wanna make sure is that we're not hiding unfavorable results. Uh, it gives the impression of a technology bias. It kind of discredits the whole, the, the, the whole effort. And then ultimately it doesn't help you make decisions and plan. You want an honest assessment of how this is gonna impact your agency and your organization. So you can make, have honest and open conversations and decisions based off of that. So what we found we've had to do on our side is really do our homework as, as our various efforts have progressed, um, both into the research and the technologies themselves, understanding what hydrogen is and what it means uh, for us, and also asking questions of our consultants team. Um, can they explain things properly? Do the answers make sense? Is what the, the, they're giving us in terms of report and analysis, does this make sense for our operations? Yeah, it looks good on paper. Sure, it looks good in a table or a graph. But if you had to apply this to an everyday scenario where you're having to rotate hundreds of buses on and off chargers, or you have buses that are sitting on a charger when they should be out on the street moving people, you're really taking that into account, especially as you're looking at fuel cell as an alternative. And then lastly, what we found is it's imperative to install and involve all of your stakeholders, both internally and externally. Uh, none of this is being done in a vacuum. This touches on every facet of, our, of an organization is what we've found as we've gone through our analyses. Um, so we really need to include those all of our stakeholders when working with the consultant teams so their voices are being heard and their concerns are being addressed. So and lastly, I have two quick examples I wanna show um, just from some of the SEPTA specific analysis that we've done up to this point. The first is relating to a, our zero emission master plan playbook, which we released last year, which included a deep dive into both of the zero emission bus technologies, um, looking at the impacts on every facet of our organization um, and ultimately the impact on service. And what we found on the next slide, when we start talking about the results, whether they be good, bad, or ugly, we really just want to present um, an assessment of where the technology currently stands at that moment in time. Um, it, it, the example here that we're showing is our schedule compatibility between the two technologies with battery with on-route charging and depot charging versus fuel cell uh, with depot fueling um, from a schedule compatibility standpoint. 
Now, again, we recognize this was a moment in time. This was done two years ago. Technology in both uh, cases has advanced. And if we reran this analysis, the results would probably change. But it's just one facet of the, the conversation where we don't want to just present one result. We just want to want to put one positive or negative slant on something because ultimately it doesn't help in the overall conversation. And then secondly, we had a deeper dive into hydrogen on the next slide. We had a, a deeper dive uh, facility report done, looking at our hydrogen needs, looking at our dispensing requirements, our delivery requirements, ultimately culminating in cost estimates, and electrical requirements. And as we see on the next slide, again, this is an example of having to involve all of our stakeholders, both internally and externally. We focus a lot on the fleet side, on the fleets, uh, fleet maintenance, the facilities, but we also have to include our financial folks, our grants folks, as we're doing right now with the loan opportunities, but also our external stakeholders in terms of our local utilities for the power requirements, you know, as we go deeper into this conversation. And what's on the screen is just an example of some of our analysis between the costs between the two technologies, which is really helping with some of the decision making and steering some of the conversation uh, here at SEPTA. So that's what I got. Um, on the last slide, just thank you for your time. All the reports I showed are publicly available at the website. And if anyone has any additional questions, conversations, recommendations, please feel reach out to me. Please feel free to reach out to me directly. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. That was great. Excellent job. So um, up next, we're going to be navigating the evolving codes and standards for fuel cell electric bus deployments. Paul Coco is going to be leading this set this session of the seminar. Um, he's a senior engineer in nuclear codes and standards for Hartford Steam Boiler. And when I asked him what his interest in the hydrogen industry is, um, is the ability to provide a base load of following capabilities to support the renewable energy sources, such as wind, solar, and providing a reliable source of energy to the balance out of the fluctuations in the supply. His future vision for the hydrogen deployment sector will be on decentralization of energy production and consumption within the communities and businesses becoming more self-sufficient, um, improving energy security, reducing the risk of power outages and increasing the resilience of local energy systems at the reduced cost environmentally friendly and economically than to, um, today's energy sources. So again, Paul, um, he's the senior engineer of nuclear codes and standards for Hart Hartford Steam Boiler and he's gonna lead us into the codes and standards discussion. Paul, take it away. Great, uh, thank you Valor Power for having me today and everybody for uh, joining me. I too am on the East Coast, so good morning or good afternoon. Uh, so looking at the historical development of codes and standards, it's uh, really become critical for ensuring safety, uh, operability, and compatibility uh, for uses of new technologies and products. In the case of hydrogen, codes and standards are essential for ensuring that hydrogen technology can be used safely and efficiently across different industry sectors, such as hydrogen generation and also power generation in regions to maintain a level of safety and reduce any type of associated risk. Next slide. When we look at the development of codes and standards, there's uh, various different players that go into the development and funding of it, and then kind of the end users. So we're going to go ahead and start with the uh, federal government, which does provide federal funding to a certain degree uh, and plays a crucial role in the developments of codes and standards. Through the National Laboratory System uh, and uh, endorsed by the Department of Energy, uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and Pacific Northwest National Laboratories are often involved in the development of codes and standards for hydrogen technologies. Uh, these labs typically work closely with industry experts, academic research, researchers, and government agencies to develop a comprehensive, uh, reliable standards that can be adopted by various stakeholders. In addition to the development of these codes and standards, federal funding also supports uh, research uh, for technical considerations related to hydrogen infrastructure, including compatibility of existing infrastructure with hydrogen technology, the safety of hydrogen storage and transportation, and the development of risk assessment models. With that, there is also additional funding that goes into utilization impact studies of hydrogen technology in specific markets, and these studies can provide uh, valuable insights on economic and environmental benefits of hydrogen technologies, as well as potential challenges of opportunities in their uh, widespread adoption. 
Besides the funding aspect, the federal government also does have entities within them that do uh, provide some regulatory authority and requirements that need to be met, such as the Environmental Protection Agency, which deals with emission controls, OSHA, which deals with safety, and the Department of Transportation. Another entity that is also critical to this is private sector firms and special interest groups. They can play an important role in the development of codes and standards of hydrogen technologies by identifying critical attributes uh, for the construction of various different components. By working with industry stakeholders and government agencies, uh, private uh, sector firms and special interest groups can help harmonize standards and perform, uh, promote uniform requirements for the development of hydrogen technologies, which can simplify permitting processes uh, for new hydrogen projects and help develop more robust and efficient supply chains. Those all funnel into codes and standards development organizations. They're typically nonprofit organizations that are accredited through the American National Standards Institute. These organizations composed of volunteers from various different backgrounds. Uh, these include owners, manufacturers, designers, regulators, that all work together and develop the standard for a specific technology. Some of these organizations you might be familiar with, uh, they include the Compressed Gas Association, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, the Institute of Electrical and, uh, and Electronics Engineering, the National Fire Protection Association, uh, just for some examples. And then finally, we go into the user end. Once the standard has been recognized by authority having jurisdiction, it can be incorporated into codified laws and become a code. State and local jurisdictions have the authority to evaluate codes and standards and decide whether to adopt them, either in part or in whole, or modify them to meet their specific needs. Keep in mind that currently there are over 90,000 jurisdictions in the United States, which include federal, state, county, municipal, tribal, and special uh, districts. This could lead to a variation of adoption of standards of codes, uh, uh, adoption of codes and standards for permitting activities across different jurisdictions. In some cases, authorities having jurisdiction may not be aware of established standards and their industry use and can lead to some inconsistencies in the adoption and enforcement of such standards. Next slide. This slide kind of represents the hierarchy where we look at the development of codes and standards from a component perspective to an industry perspective and how they get adopted into the code. Codes and standards are typically organized in this hierarchy beginning at the component level and extend to specific industry and then finally uh, local codes. At the component level, uh, design standards serve as the basis for construction for critical components such as process piping. Uh, pressurized uh, tanks, ventilation systems, rotary equipment, cryogenics, dispensing equipment, overpressure protection. These design standards provide detailed guidance on the design, fabrication, installation of these components to ensure their safe and reliable operation. Keep in mind that some of these components may have cross industry applications and might need additional considerations for the type of operational service, uh, including hydrogen. And these are kind of uh, some examples of some of the standards that you might be using. Next slide. As we move up the hierarchy, we have industry specific standards. Uh, in this case, we look at the National Fire Protection Association II, which is an example of a code which uh, specifically targets all aspects of hydrogen technology, to including infrastructure for hydrogen, for dispensing, and vehicle maintenance. At these higher uh, uh, tier codes and standards, they do provide a comprehensive framework for safe and effective use of hydrogen technologies, which might incorporate requirements for component design standards to ensure that these technologies are designed, installed, and operating in a manner that meets code safety requirements. Next slide. The final level of the codes and standards is typically at the authority having jurisdiction at the state and local levels, which may endorse specific fire, electrical, and building and mechanical codes that directly or indirectly reference national standards or component design standards as requirements to, for the permitting process for a given facility. In addition to some of these local codes and standards, there are also federal standards, as I said before, that need to be met, such as OSHA for occupational health and safety, DOT for uh, risk assessment planning for transportation, and then also uh, the EPA for any type of uh, um, emissions discharge. 
Next slide. This slide provides an example of uh, a specific industry code and standard, uh, which are incorporated by reference into state or local codes. In this case, we're looking at an example of the California Fire Protection Code from 2012, which addresses uh, items such as hydrogen storage and generation equipment and site specific references to equipment requirements that can either be used to meet specific attributes or construct in accordance with a specific standard. Note that in this case, 2012, th this obviously is a little dated. There is not a direct link to ASME boiler pressure vessel codes for storage tanks, which is the uh, common norm of how these tanks are to be constructed. And it's further cited uh, within their uh, compliance issues to seek uh, third party experts to perform overview systems and components based on the level of understanding of the authorities. So they have identified some shortcomings when it comes to hydrogen storage. In the second example, we see for hydrogen process piping that there was a hydrogen standard at the time which deals with uh, b3112 and they also have notes not to use uh, b313 for cast iron piping uh, valves and fittings which are susceptible to hydrogen embrittlement next slide within a permitting approach due to the lack of code support and understanding uh of authorities having jurisdiction. Many times site owners and manufacturers must provide technical information to address concerns for fitness for service or a risk-based assessment modeling. Traditional methods use a uh, persp uh, prospective approach based on the development of standards uh, from industries, best practices and established norms uh, that still might be called into question by zoning boards uh, which do not really see a direct endorsement of such codes and standards uh, to ensure safety and operability of a facility. In this case, a descriptive approach might be used uh, qu uh, quantitatively showing performance-based uh, measures to ensure adequate safety margins to improve safety within a formally uh, endorsed code. This can be done through modeling software for problematic risk assessment models, such as the HIRAM Plus, developed by DOE's Sandia National Labs and is a open source program, so anybody can upload that. Authorities having jurisdiction permitting, uh, permitting processes may vary from a perspective, a, a, a persp a perspective or a uh, descriptive approach or a combination of both of the two as more unified established practices uh, for permitting are developed. Next slide. This is an example of what you would normally see for the permitting process. Um, this is taken out of uh, one of the handbooks that California has uh, posed for its permitting process, but is applicable through any type of processes that you do. Uh, from the per permitting uh, to the final commissioning of a hydrogen station, typically we see these standards activities across the board, uh, which include uh, pre-application outreach and understanding of what the requirements are with the authority jur having jurisdiction. Uh, this would be your pre uh, permitting activity after we uh, go through the plan. After that, we go through the planning and building to review, uh, um, which could be within various different uh, jurisdictional zone committees. And finally, uh, a fam final approval uh, and then fi uh, final commission. Unlike most big infrastructure projects, we typically don't see any type of third party inspection until the end of the construction, which might identify issues that could further delay the commissioning of the facility. One such example that we did see is that much of the equipment, uh, especially the um, electrolyzers, were purchased uh, in, from Europe and certified under the uh, pressure equipment directive used in Europe, which is not permitted in the United States. In this case, the boiler pressure chief of the state, which was responsible for signing off on this, had to approve it as a one-time variance, which is uh, considered a state special, in order to facilitate uh, it, the, uh, the facility to be commissioned. Now, if the constructor developer were uh, building multiple sites using the same plan, this could cause significant issues for commissioning of those other sites if the uh, error for code certification equipment repeated multiple times over. Next slide. Some of the activities that we perform at Hartford Steam Boiler are typically independent verification of ASME code stamps, which is our main core of business as an authorized inspection agency. Third party inspection, which is basically the same as ASME, um, but without code stamping and does expand to mechanical equipment, testing and quality programs. And then finally DOT for certifying uh, transport storage tanks. 
Additionally, HSB can address um, additional items such as performing activities in rotary equipment, cryogenic systems, uh, gas dispensers and chillers, and heat exchanging systems. Next slide. As the renewable energy industry continues to grow and evolve, there will be an increased need for innovative insurance products that can address the unique risk associated with these technologies, such as performance guarantees, um, service inspections, safety monitoring, and cybersecurity, which are all important areas that can benefit from insurance co uh, coverage and investor funding. From, developments, uh, from developing uh, products such as this, HSB can help mitigate risk and renewable energy providers and promote the growth and adoption of these technologies. Next slide. For more information, you can either reach out to me or through our email right here. And again, thanks again for listening to my presentation. Thank you, Paul. Up next is our final panelist today. Um, so make sure that you send those questions into our panelists so that they can respond. We've got one question there, Paul, if you can address that now that you've wrapped up your, your session, that would be much appreciated. Our panelists up next, um, Tim Sassian is going to talk about funding, consulting and information resources. Tim is the Director of Market Development and Public Relations for Ballard Power Systems, and he's a wealth of information and knowledge. So Tim and I are always available um, on behalf of Ballard to reach out to those transit groups and partners that are looking to expand their fleets to hydrogen fuel cell technology and the path um, to get you there. We're there to help, and so is Sydney. So make sure you reach out. We're going to be sure. I just want to do some housekeeping items um, along the way. If you haven't participated in the first two sessions, we are going to um, put that link up at the end of this session. We encourage you to watch those again as the deadline for the low and no funding is, is coming up shortly, April 13th at 11.59. So Tim, he's going to lead us into the funding, consulting, and information resources for fuel cell, deploy, uh, fuel cell electric bus deployment. Tim, the floor is yours. Thanks, Kim. Um, I'm super excited to be a part of this this year. Um, for everybody who is in transit and looking to do zero emission buses, the wind is at your back now. It's really time to take advantage. I don't want to try to push people into doing impetuous moves, but there are a lot of funding opportunities out there, and there are a lot of information resources out there, and really you just need to take the time to find it. Um, there's some really good ones that I pointed out on this slide. These slides will go out to everyone at the end of this, so you can hit these links uh, for U.S. funding, I definitely recommend the Desire database that pans all of renewable energy, including transportation. It's an excellent resource. Pay attention to CMAC funding. If you're in a air quality attainment zone, that has provided uh, funding for zero emission buses for other transit agencies. DOE has a lot of information resources on their Hydrogen Fuel Cell Technology Office website. H2 Matchmaker is one of those that will show you a lot of new hydrogen activity that's coming out uh, around the nation. If you're in California, there's a few specific funding resources you can hit like HBIP and Energize for Infrastructure and also CalStart has an excellent tool for finding funding uh, in California. For information, there's some great organizations, California Hydrogen Business Council, a long time great source of information. Their fuel cell electric bus info page is fantastic. Uh, check out NREL's fuel cell electric bus evaluations. They've been evaluating fuel cell buses for over 20 years and they've got a lot of great information there. The U.S. Hydrogen Alliance is starting a new service called H2Net. There'll be uh, opportunities to interact with other hydrogen users on that. H2Tools.org, check that out. Ballard, we got tons of information, case studies from real implementations of this stuff out in the wild. And Sandia Labs has a great uh, codes and standards tool as well that you can check out uh, for getting more acquainted with what's going to be relevant in your area. The U.S. federal government has definitely stood behind hydrogen strongly. Uh, Secretary Granholm in particular is really endorsing this. She set out the hydrogen shock for uh, production costs of one buck a kilogram by 2030 with interim targets as well. That has stimulated a fantastic amount of activity in green hydrogen production. Along with the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, lots of new hydrogen providers coming out across the country uh, to take advantage of that and give you reduced hydrogen prices. Along with all of this, comes the hydrogen hub activity. And I'm sure most people have heard about that on the call. In fact, many people are frantically getting their submissions in by the April 7th deadline. But 
pretty much every state in the nation, except for a couple, and they may still announce it, has hydrogen hub activity in it. The DOE has encouraged 33. We know of at least 23 so far. Um, and they're shown here. And they're all over the place. And what these are doing is stimulating new activity in producing green hydrogen, renewable hydrogen, hydrogen from zero carbon or low carbon sources all over the nation. So definitely, and from many different players. Uh, at Ballard, we believe in a competitive marketplace, and we can help it to connect you with the fuel resources and different resources that you'll need in your area to make your hydrogen fuel cell bus deployment truly successful. Lastly, I want to leave you with this idea that hydrogen is here to help. It really depends for your sustainability, what your initial feedstock is, whether you're electric or hydrogen. You can start with wind, solar, and geothermal, put it on the grid and charge your battery bus, or you can put it through an electrolyzer, get some hydrogen, and fuel your fuel cell electric bus. By the same way, you can use renewable methane in your thermal power plant and charge your battery bus through the grid or separate it through an SMR, a steam methane reformer, use that hydrogen for your fuel cell electric vehicle. Once the electron or the molecule get to your bus, it's zero carbon. The carbon question happens at the fuel. And really, the way this all works out is the two technologies complement each other. It's not a VHS versus Betamax situation. It's really a solar plus wind power situation where we find the two technologies actually complement each other and help to fulfill that whole decarbonization period. It's not batteries or fuel cells, it's batteries and fuel cells. Just the way it has been in the past for using diesel for big machines and gasoline for small machines, the same is going to apply for hydrogen and grid power as we use these things. So again, hydrogen is here to help. We're going to make that full decarbonization story happen. And do reach out to us if you have any questions or concerns about that. Thanks for, for listening. Well, thank you, Tim. So that wraps up our presentation today. As I mentioned, the deadline for the low no application funding is April 13th, um, 2023 at 11.59. It's a hard stop for sure. So we're here to assist. Our emails are all included here. We are going to be sending out um, all the details related to the last three seminars over the next um, 24 hours. You'll receive that in your inbox. Plus there's that, that tips paper that Sydney mentioned in her, her presentation that we'll be circulating. So again, everybody's here as a resource. If there's any questions, please put them in the Q&A over the next couple of minutes and uh, we'll be happy to address them. But thank you everybody. This is the last of the three seminar, uh, the three um, presentations. And on behalf of Ballard, we ask you to participate in any further presentations that we'll be doing over the next year and continue to build your electrification plans to include hydrogen fuel cell technology. Thank you. I'm Kim Leach with Ballard Power Systems. Tim, do you want to read through some of the question and answers here just to help people with some of the comments here? Maybe the, the question about what are wheel to well benefits of fuel cell electric vehicles? I can expand on that one. I answered that one. Um, it's a good question. Now, for a, a, a battery electric bus that's being charged by a solar panel directly, the, the efficiency question is definitely in favor of the battery electric bus. However, the way that we're seeing grid power have to be gathered and distributed requires one, large battery installations for when the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining, and two, DC fast chargers for fueling up these vehicles or charging these vehicles in a reasonable amount of time. Each of those require a battery bank, and the, the state of California has done several studies on very large-scale battery banks, and the round-trip efficiency that they're seeing is something like 70 to 80 percent, and part of that is self-discharge, Part of that is all the uh, heating and ventilation and air conditioning that's needed to keep the batteries at a happy place. When you put those efficiencies in series, along with the efficiency over the grid, the power conversion efficiency, the charger efficiency, you get to a similar efficiency as what you see in combining an electrolyzer with a fuel cell. Um, moreover, what's more important gets back to what I was talking about for completing the picture we have to gather at least four to five times the amount of renewable energy that we do right now to satisfy our decarbonization. That means we've got to reach out to places that we haven't been able to before to get solar, wind, geothermal, and places that want it, uh, nuclear or other sources of zero carbon energy. 
And some of those places, a lot of those places are going to be difficult to put grid connections on uh, or very expensive. And that's where hydrogen can really help to collect that for offshore wind, for remote deserts, for remote uh, mountain valleys. We can collect that energy uh, economically where the grid might have trouble. So again, it's, it's a complementary sense where these, these two technologies are going to be working together. Thank you, Tim. And then there was a second question here about uh, is ASME developing construction rules for H2 service? Um, a, a little bit confused by the question, but in general, we look at NFPA 30A is the code that covers motor fuel dispensing facilities and repair garages. So SEPTA is actually looking at their mid-val depot and looking to do modifications to it to allow the servicing of hydrogen fuel cells in that facility. And we are referencing the code for NFPA 30A for that project. And then NFPA 2 is the over 258 page code that covers hydrogen technologies that has to do with not only generation, but also installation or construction, storage, piping, use, and the handling of both gaseous and cryogenic liquid hydrogen. So both of those are great to have a basis on. Um, generally, when you work with an industrial gas provider, they will have a lot of knowledge into those two um, code systems. And then I did provide a link in the chat to a new version of NFPA 2 that is coming out later in 2023, which is recruit reducing setback distances from lot lines and air intake from 75 feet down to 48 to 44 feet, which in something that we did like for Tyler's facilities, which are really, really space constrained, this is gonna help a ton for space constrained transit yards and fitting in these 50 to 100 bus hydrogen fueling stations. Yeah, and I could also add to that as well. Um, ASME is uh, looking at developing rules for electrolyzers within section eight. Um, since uh, these components do have pressure, a lot of the states have requirements to the boiler chief that these are ASME code stamped. So it's going to vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So uh, as I said, we might have situations to where we see that um, NFPA2 does cover it from a high level that tells you that you need to meet a certain standard, but the jurisdiction that standard would be ASME if it's uh, pressure uh, vessel equipment, essentially, that it would need to be stamped as such. So there, there is some disconnects, um, you know, between the two of them. So it is, you know, it could be a little precarious to navigate, uh, you know, between the component standards and the industry standards to make sure that you're meeting the, the applicable, um, you know, jurisdictional standards. Uh, and like I said, uh, some of these come into play. Uh, Title 24 uh, deals with the uh, construction codes or the building codes in California, where Title 20 or Title 9 deals with the the jurisdictional chief's uh, authority. So it, it's um, it's good to know what some of those pitfalls might be uh, off the bat instead of figuring it out at the at the tail end when you're trying to get this commissioned. And I think another benefit, at least for transit, is that when we look at SEPTA and MTA, the AHJ there is the transit agency themselves. So I think the benefit there is that at times you don't have to go to the building department, you're able to just go directly to the fire department, considering the AHJ is the transit agency. So something to look into in your own jurisdiction, but something that we have encountered and has been a positive situation um, for both SEPTA and the MTA. I see Harpal Kapoor has a question for Tyler. That's an expert right there. Um, Tyler, you want to take on his question about the uh, cost for hydrogen? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as part of our master plan uh, development, our consultant team reached out to a number of different hydrogen suppliers out here on the East Coast, up through New York, Southern Canada, um, and down into Appalachia, just to see what our kind of region was providing. And the estimates we were getting back was somewhere around seven to nine kilograms uh, seven to nine dollars per kilogram liquid delivered um you know as we're moving forward with some of our efforts we've got a, a 10 10 fuel cell bus pilot uh coming up uh we're starting to see some prices on the lower end of that range um in the low low seven dollars um which we expect to get better you know as the industry matures We did have a question about uh, fuel cell buses versus ice, hydrogen ICE. I think we're going to see a lot of activity in hydrogen ICE. It's got to find kind of its place in the ecosystem. Um, there are efficiency benefits to fuel cell. Um, they are more efficient than combustion engines. And um, 
we have seen that consistently as we're increasing in efficiency as well. But moreover, what a fuel cell electric bus offers is true zero emissions. When you have a combustion engine, if you're using air from the outside, um, you're going to have nitrogen in that air and it's going to oxidize and that makes pollution, that makes a precursor to uh, uh, smog. Um, so you won't be able to achieve true zero emissions with an ICE engine because of that aspect. Um, whereas with a fuel cell engine, you're going to be zero emissions from the outset. You could have trouble in some places. I know California sees combustion as a no-no. Um, we'll see what other states like New York have to say. Other states may be more lenient in that, um, but do follow it. It's not a simple conversion to go from gasoline to to hydrogen ICE, make sure if you decide to go in that direction to evaluate your, your technology wisely. Um, but we still feel that that fuel cell is the best long-term solution that's gonna give you zero emissions from day one. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, it looks like there was a question mm -hmm. too about budget. So it said, this is a question for Sydney. I believe it was in your slide of a sample budget for the grant that the total cost is 12.4 million and a federal ask is 11 million. Can you confirm that the federal funds are at such a scale? It looks it looks like a very nice grant. Thank you. So Fernando, that is true. I think we're in an extremely fortunate situation with these low no grants. The infrastructure is covered at a 90% federal share and rolling stock is covered at 85%. So yes, when we built this budget for a 12.4 million total project, over 11.1 .1 million of that was coming from the federal government and the rest needed to be a local match. But um, I think, you know, when you're able to to put in a grant for that and, and the fueling facility could fuel anywhere from 50 to 100 buses, it's huge to put together a program like this. Um, and I think keep in mind that KTC has resources um, working for Ballard to help you write these low no's, submit them, and we have success in getting um, a winning response. Thank you, Sydney, for addressing that. So that wraps us up almost to the top of the hour. I don't see any new questions coming in. Again, Sue Hill, um, our marketing panelist, has in, has uploaded in the chat session the link to the previous webinars, and it concludes the third of the series for the low and no grant applications. And again, Tim, if you can just put everybody's contacts up at the end so that they can take a look. Um, and reach out to us if they have any further questions. But again, this will be shared um, with everybody that's registered today. And uh, I don't see any more questions coming in and the panelists are starting to drop off. So thank you again. This is Kim on behalf of Ballard and our third and a final of the series, the low and no grant application. Good luck everyone. Go win some awards. Yeah. All right, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining.